Hey everyone. Yeah. Um, my name is Mark Maunder. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of, of WordFence. Um, we're going to chat about security. And um, as uh, you probably heard, there was another speaker that was supposed to speak about um, was it AMPT, I think, yeah. and uh, couldn't make it. So we're filling in. Um, we've had a, a couple of hours to put something together. Um, we're going to improvise a little bit. And what we're going to do is a panel, and it's going to be a Q&A uh, session. So uh, we're really going to kind of get you guys to guide uh, the conversation here. And uh, what I want to, what I think we should do, since we've only got 30 minutes, is um, try to keep each question and discussion to two minutes-ish. If it goes over, that's fine. Um, but let's let's try to keep it moving along where we can and not go too deep down any rabbit holes. <coughs> And um, I'll, I'll act as moderator where necessary, probably won't be very necessary, um, and I'll just introduce uh, the rest of the team. Um, this is Tim Cantrell. Uh, Tim is a customer support engineer for WordPens, and uh, he thinks about security a lot. Uh, this is Matthew Barry. Um, Matt is uh, the lead developer at WordPens, um, which means he's the most senior developer in our organization. He actually wrote our firewall. Um, so Matt's, uh, and he's done a lot of research as well, so Matt's uh, deeply technical. Um, this is Sean Murphy. Uh, Sean is also a senior developer with WordFence, and Sean heads up our threat intelligence uh, project. So what that means is that he is in charge of organizing all of the attack data that we get and turning that into uh, threat intelligence, which we operationalize by putting into our products, and that does a better job of protecting you guys from, from hackers. We're going to keep this conversation um, vendor neutral. We're not going to you know, try to sell you WordFence, and we don't want to really turn it into a, a WordFence uh, support session. I think what we'd like to do is just chat about WordPress security in, in general. Um, if, uh, if it comes up, that's cool. But um, we'll kind of try to keep it fairly, fairly neutral. Um, so uh, in Atlanta recently, uh, there was a, um, a ransomware attack that targeted the city. Who's heard about that? Probably spot everyone here. Uh, they got the bill recently, and uh, it was 2.7 million dollars. Um, the the hackers were only asking for 50,000, as reasonable as hackers are. And uh, <laughs> um, so I think security for all of us is top of mind. And of course, we all run uh, WordPress here and are passionate about it. So you know, uh, how to protect our websites, our WordPress websites, is uh, very much something we we think about. Um, and I think to start, what we're going to do is um, turn the tables a little bit. Um, we're going to ask you guys a question. Um, and the question is, what do you think is the biggest security threat facing WordPress today? And we, we've given a little, little bit of thought, but we'd like to hear from you first, and then we'll chat about it. So go ahead, sir. The WPJSON API and the user endpoint, showing all the usernames and IDs. OK. Um, and if you don't mind, if you guys could introduce yourselves, uh, just name and... Um, um, Ricky Lee Whittemore, I'm a lead engineer at Tenno. Awesome. Um, cool. Good company, thanks. by the way. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, my name is Drew. Um, I'm a newbie, but I would guess that the biggest threat is actually from users not updating. Okay. Um, anyone else? I'm yes, seeing a lot of SQL injection across site scripting as well. Mm. Okay. Um, anyone else? Um, all right, so to share our point of view on this, I'm going to hand it to Tim. Go ahead, man. Um, <clears throat> those are all good points. Uh, Drew was actually the closest because the biggest threat to WordPress uh, security today is you. And I'm going to just to sink in for a second because that sounds like, oh my God, what did that guy just say? Um, I. It's literally you. Uh, any plugin, any security product can protect against a lot of things. We can we can protect against that. We can protect against your SQL injections. We can protect a lot of things, but I can't force you to choose a good password. I can tell you why you shouldn't have a bad password like Mark123 or something. Inside joke. I've actually uh, used that password okay. a long time ago, and he keeps giving me a hard time about it. So that's All what that's the about. Time. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but we can't make you have better practices when it comes to that. Plugin updates. We can tell you to update your plugins. Keep them updated. Mm -hmm. Don't run that plugin that says turn off all updates notifications. We can tell you to not do that. 
uh, and you miss security updates like that, but but we can't make you update your plugins or your themes or your core. Uh, the biggest threat to WordPress security is quite frankly you, and, and that's where um, I think there needs to be a change in focus with um, the WordPress community. We all need to to partner together. The, the security plugins, the security products, and the, and the actual customers have to partner together. Um, what was the number? Really? What was the number on Atlanta? What did you say? How much? Two point seven million. Two point seven million. Okay, and that's not what probably it's not going to cost you two point seven to recover your site. But do you? Does anybody here spend time on their site? I mean, do you invest your time and your heart and your soul and your content for the people that do the the blogs and stuff? Man, it's like hurting a kid. When somebody comes in, you feel that way when you're compromised, and and. That's the takeaway. You need to think about, I mean, people say this all the time, you just blow it off sometimes, but you need to think about security before you get compromised. And so what we're really uh, facing is an awareness uh, challenge and a user education challenge. Um, certainly there are many areas that we as security vendors and uh, open source developers and so on could be doing a better job. But if you look at Atlanta, for example, um, I'm, I don't know the details of the case, but I suspect that there were Windows machines that hadn't been updated for a while to the latest patch level. And again, that's just a user education uh, problem, uh, systems administrator education. Um, so that, that's really the point we're getting at there. Um, anyone got any questions about that in particular? Uh, yes, sir. Just wondering, you know, what I, I have a very simplistic view of, of security, but things that can happen is people can go out and just mess with your site, destroy data. They can steal data or they can play the, the ransomware game and we'll give it back to you. So, to me, the biggest problem, if I can make backups that they can't find, is stealing my data. So, they, if they steal the data, then I've got a problem, it's out of my hands. It, it's beyond me, I can't, recover, I can't reverse mm -hmm. that. Right. So the only thing I could possibly do would be to obscure it. So it seems to me there ought to be a bag of tricks that just for the run of the mill guy that says, Here's how to obscure the most important data that you have so that your run-of-the-mill hacker, when he goes out and grabs it, is actually going to be in deeper problems than he ever imagined when he tries to use it. Okay. So th there's two th sort of points of discussion I think I I'd like to cover there. Um, th the first one is um, the best way to ob obscure your data is to get rid of it, uh, delete it. And uh, internally, we have an ongoing project to get rid of as much data as we can. Uh, delete unnecessary user data, look at what data we're storing, is it necessary, perhaps we can change our application, uh, tokenize things um, rather than storing the, the actual data. Um, and so just thinking about what you can get rid of, what you can delete, um, and, and going ahead and doing that is um, a really great approach. Uh, the first guy who mentioned that to me was um, Mike Don, the um, Chief Security Officer of Square. Uh, I was chatting to him at B-Sides in San Francisco, and uh, he introduced me to that idea and, uh, years ago, and um, I think it's very simple but quite brilliant. Matt, if you don't mind uh, chatting a little bit about um, hashing uh, as a, uh, a way to obscure data um, when it comes to passwords. Yeah, uh, um, and also, too, with uh, you know, things like uh, personally identifiable information, things like that. Um, hashes are... are um, generated from a one-way function, meaning that there's no way to take a hash and get back to um, the original piece of text that was created through this hashing function. Um, so it's a way for us to, to have um, a representation of data um, that we can, you know, we can look at it in a, in a large data set, but it doesn't actually get tied back to the original piece of data. And, so, and as, also, too, with passwords as well. Um, you know, I was talking with you a little bit about this earlier. Um, the way that passwords are stored um, matters a lot um, when it comes to large-scale breaches where there's huge um, databases of user accounts um, that are released out, on, uh, out onto the web. Um, and a lot of the passwords in there are, are weaker passwords that get cracked pretty easily uh, through password cracking, uh, depending on what um, uh, hash, hashing algorithm was used. Um, but the, the weaker the hashing algorithm, the easier it is for stronger passwords to get correct. 
Um, and that's one of the risks that um, we face, even when you use a stronger password, um, depending on, uh, on how, it's, um, how it's set up. So, um, so really, um, you know, in terms of uh, protecting data by obscuring it or, or getting rid of it, you know, getting rid of it is easy. Uh, you can probably log into cPanel and uh, delete files, um, you know, go into your, your database and get rid of records you don't need, um, get rid of user accounts you don't need, that kind of thing. Um, hashing is really a, more of a developer tool. Uh, it's a technique that we use to uh, put data in a form that is, is usable and recognizable and uniquely identifiable, but uh, not reversible. Um, so that's, that's something that's used um, quite a lot by uh, developers. Um, ahead, sir. You, you mentioned uh, tokenizing. Was, was that mm. just another word for hashing? Yeah, well, actually, um, what I was thinking about when I mentioned that was uh, uh, one of the payment processors we use, and we're actually moving away from them, but authorized.net is owned by uh, Visa. And um, one of the things they do is we don't want to store credit card numbers, right? right. So when we accept a transaction from our customers, um, if our servers get breached, we don't want uh, a database of credit card numbers to live there. And so what we actually do is as soon as the transaction occurs, we pass that data through to Visa. And uh, they process the transaction. And we want the ability to rebuild that credit card. Instead of storing it, uh, they store it on site. And, and they're extremely secure. They're you know, a credit card issuer. And, um, and they then give us a unique identifier that we can use to reference that record. Mm -hmm. And so that's the, the token I was really referring to. And so that, that's a form of tokenization. And so we want to, when we want to rebuild, we just say, you know, bill ID such and such, so much uh, money. And um, if we're breached, there's, there's nothing there that's useful. Right. Um, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, Aaron. Just kind of as a follow-up, I, I was curious when, when he was talking about obscuring data if there was specific data that he had in mind, because most of these things mm -hmm. um, seem like they would make sense for data that you didn't really need and get rid of, mm -hmm. or data that you are just trying to match up against itself in mass, but you don't need the original data. But it doesn't necessarily work for any data that you, you still need, right? Content or, or whatever. So I just I was curious what kind of if he had examples of data that he was talking about in the original question. Um, did you have a particular uh, kind of data in mind? <coughs> I think he was talking about that. Oh, okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, you know, uh, my first thought came from uh, practical experience. Uh, we have a medical office. And uh, we have electronic medical record systems sort of tied in with some things that we do. And one of the dilemmas that I ran into is uh, there's no way to ever delete a patient. Now, in theory, doctors do need to keep the data for a certain number of years, but after that point, there's it's, it's just a honeypot. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. And I, I haven't encountered an electronic medical record vendor yet that has a delete old patients option and they're software it's amazing but so so anyway in, in in the course of interconnecting things and maybe making them work together uh, some of those things are in the back of my mind is is problems uh, but uh, just from the standpoint of uh, trying to uh, do it the best way that I can just glad to hear what your thoughts are really I, I don't I don't I don't know necessarily how the um, what the uh, you know the regulations are for storing medical data, but if there's a way to make data that is like like as you said, older patient records, make it um, not accessible. Um, so if there is a, a breach or a compromise for a website or into a, a network or something like that, if it's not on that network, if it's stored on an offsite backup or something like that, still you still have it. Um, that would be an option. That's the uh, industry has a perjury bias yet. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a difficult problem to solve. <clears throat> um, ladies and gentlemen, um, Aaron uh, is head of WordPress security, and we're very glad to have him here. It's one of the things I love about WordPress is uh, everyone's very accessible. Um, I always love chatting with, with him at WordCamps when I have the opportunity. We had a good chat last night, but um, just in case you didn't know who he is, if you have any questions, hit him up afterwards. Uh, we're, <laughs> we're good friends with him. Um, yes? So I use WordPress, so I didn't even know that was the guy, so... Oh, so happy.
happy to see that there's people behind the emails that I read. Because you never know. But these guys are bots. I'm the yeah. actual yeah. person <laughs> here. Andrew. Um, so I didn't really like it. I probably don't even use like three quarters of the services that you offer. Um, but like if, if a website's been compromised and then I put WordPress on there and there's some, I'm not really good with the language, but there's some string that's in there already and then it gets called up after, you know what I'm saying? Like That, that appears in the scan findings? Yes. Are you saying? And they're in but they, they wait for like a year or two to call it up. Do you know what I'm saying? To get the data out. So like a sleeper uh, kind of a backdoor? Yeah. A Trojan? Mm -hmm. yeah. Backdoor. Yeah, I guess like the, yeah, because I had one I had a website that I that was compromised, I fixed. Um, I put word fence on it, but but I think there was something still in the code. We didn't get it all out. So I had to re basically redo the website. And my question is, was there something I could have done through WordFence to like scan everything to find that? Sure. Um, I, I, again, putting it in after the fact. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, again, you know, I'll try to make this vendor neutral. I, I don't want to turn it into kind of a sales session. No, no, absolutely. <laughs> but um, what, what you're really talking about is um, malware scanning or, or doing a security scan that includes a malware scan, and um, that's one of the things that, that we do. And there's other companies that do that as well. Um, and um, yeah, by all means, if you were to uh, use a reputable scanner and, and scan your site um, and, and there's anything malicious in there, it, it should come up. And I'll, I'll give you a few examples. Um, whether it's a, a standalone script that is in one of your web directories um, that allows someone remote access to your site, that, that should come up. Uh, if it is code that is injected into your uh, one of your source files that gets loaded every time ac someone accesses that area of the website, uh, that should come up. Um, if it's something in the database, uh, then that should come up as well. Um, what else, Matt? Have I, have put I covered on before your malware scan is done. Oh yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if it was put on quite some time ago and it's still there, we should be able to pick it up. Um, uh, yeah. Something I wanted to mention is that uh, you know if your website is compromised, uh, you obviously need to find the malware and remove it. Um, and, and if you don't have this, the skills to do that yourself, you might need to hire somebody to help you with that remediation process. <coughs> um, and so a lot of times, if um, there's malware that is missed by uh, a tool that you're using, an a, a professional analyst should be able to find it still. Mm -hmm. um, but another thing is, besides just removing the malware, you also need to figure out how the hacker got in, how you were compromised right. in the first place, and fix that. Otherwise, they can just walk through that same yeah. door again mm -hmm. and well, put the malware using, right back. I think, I think it was the um, hosting company, honestly, that I was using, and so I just moved the whole site over to... Mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell you. Say, Some other God. company. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I, I moved it, created a new one because I knew that. I, I mean, I do know how to go in there and take everything out, so that's not an issue. But um, I thought I had it all, and and it wasn't your, it wasn't worth that. that it was the hosting company's malware. Okay. Um, there, there, it goes along those lines. Um, can you speak to server-side scanner, kind of, trying not to use the competitor's name, um, that are offered, whether or not they're any good, and do you offer that also? Server-side scanners where you would put a piece of code on, you're actually... Yeah, I, I think it's okay if you mention another vendor's name. It's, okay. it's fine. Who are you talking about? Uh, Security.net uses that. Um, and uh, which... I'm not aware of a server side scanner. Are you talking about their plugin? Uh, no, it's not a plugin. It's actually a code you can get. I have to pay extra for this. Is it? And we put it on the server side when people are not using a web host that we prefer. We'll put that on there, and it almost invariably will find something, and it's 
a great way for us to say this is what's happening. Okay. That's, I, you know, um, do you mind visiting us, our, our booth afterwards and we can get more technical data um, on what you're describing? Okay. That way we can fully understand it, it and I think right. give you a... Go ahead, man. I think it's... it's is, it, is it called an agent? No, is it, and there's a piece of PHP code. Yeah, I, I, I know that they have, um, I think it's SightScan is their, their web-based one, yeah, but they also have an agent. That's their free thing. I'm not talking about that. They have, yeah, the, the, I think the thing that you're talking about the, is the agent. The that's site part scan of that. that they do is a thing that, you know, they're scanning everything that they can publicly access. It's what remote. What talking about is the server-side version scan. of that, which they, they have a piece of PHP that they can access that mm -hmm. lets them then see the code inside all the other PHP mm -hmm. files, yeah. right? So that's um, that's what the server side then does, okay. rather than just looking at what can be accessed yeah. and yeah. then look at the code behind it. Okay, yeah, so it's just, that's, whether it's WordFence or that, you know, we're both running on the server, um, examining PHP code, and um, finding malware. Okay, um, so sorry. yours is not a separate standalone item, though, right? That it runs uh, on the server, um, but the interface mm -hmm. is within your web browser. Interesting. Yeah, so and we're looking at source code. Service. and Say again? That's with the paid uh, service? Free service, actually, yeah. and paid. Um, and, and both of them work extremely well. Because um, yeah. I use them together. I mean, I have work on some 50 some sites. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, we're friends with some of the folks from Security, and they're yeah, all cool. I like Tony. <laughs> and uh, we actually work with uh, uh, security I'll vendors. Stop by and ask. Yeah, sure. <laughs> security vendors collaborate um, sometimes when there's a really bad threat out there. We'll jump on the phone and you know kind of get a group together and say you know how can we better serve the community. So. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned malware scans um, on a site that's got WordFence on it from the beginning. Is it? Recommended to do? Do I need to do malware scans? Yeah. Beyond what WordFence is doing. For yeah. Me? So in, in security, in the security, or mm -hmm. any other product like that. It, so this applies to any product and anything that you're protecting. Uh, in the security industry, we use the uh, phrase a, a layered approach to security. And uh, so you don't just want one thing that you're using to protect um, your, your site or your asset. Um, you, you want uh, multiple layers so that if one or two of them fail, uh, you have fail safes. And so when it comes to protecting your website, um, you, want, you definitely want a firewall. Um, that's going to protect your site from the newest threats um, before you have an opportunity to update, for example. Is that what WordFence is doing for Yeah, you? we're a firewall. Uh, Cloudflare, Security, uh, there's other vendors out there. They're all, they all have a firewall. Um, there's some security plugins that don't have a firewall, um, so you know, keep an eye out for that. Um, and then a good malware scanner, I would say, is essential. And, and that's kind of your, 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 your second layer, uh, your second line of defense. Um, if something, God forbid, should get through the firewall, uh, and land on your uh, website, the malware scanner will pick it up and let you know about it and you can react quickly rather than having it sit there and, for example, create SEO spam for several months, ruin your website's reputation and uh, cost you a lot of effort and potentially money and business. Um, so. That's two layers. Yeah. Um, is that it? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> Guys, we got any more layers? <laughs> I think it's about it. It's a multi-layer, huh? But yeah. WordFence does malware scans, right? Yeah. That's what I'm That's doing when I scan the... Yeah. It's a, it's a security scan, and it includes <coughs> um, scanning for malware and um, uh, vulnerabilities, uh, plugins with known issues, mm -hmm. um, a whole bunch of stuff. So, And, uh, you know, you we can tell you more about that at the booth, for sure. You have to proactively put the firewall on, correct? Uh, it turns on by default, uh, and if you want it fully optimized, you can enable that. But um, definitely hit us up with product questions at our booth where we have mm -hmm. all the rest of today and, and tomorrow to answer that. Um, next question. All right, well, let me see how much time we got. We have five minutes left, so uh, just for fun. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to talk about crypto mining, but I, I actually want to jump to um, <laughs> s s JavaScript because this is more, um, will have more of a positive impact, I think. Uh, if you install JavaScript on your website, um, who's done that before? Put a piece of code, JavaScript code, on your website that's, that's loading a script from somewhere. Who's, who's done that in the room? Yeah, I've done it. Anyone go Google Analytics? No. If you've got it, you've done it, right? 
And so what that's doing is uh, someone visits your website, uh, your code loads in their browser, their browser sees the JavaScript tag and loads that JavaScript from somewhere else. And uh, when you do that, what you're doing is you're actually handing that um, the person who controls that server and that code the keys to the kingdom, in a, in a sense. Uh, they, ha they have the ability to execute code within your um, site visitor's web browser, and they can do all kinds of things with that code. They can throw up a fake login screen. They can run code that mines cryptocurrency and exploits the CPU power of your site visitor's uh, browser. Um, and a lot of people aren't actually aware of, of those risks. Uh, when it comes to Google, uh, I, think, I think we all trust Google, maybe. <laughs> Take a poll. But um, uh, I think we all trust the GA team, the Google Analytics team. And uh, you know we're OK. We get a huge benefit from GA. Uh, so we put it on our sites, and we're OK with that. They have a good QA process, great security team. Um, but sometimes you're putting code from a, a smaller company, a company in another jurisdiction, uh, a new company, perhaps a company that just got sold to someone. And what I really wanted to have a brief conversation about, since we've got a few minutes left, is just to kind of create awareness among you folks that that it's really worth thinking about um, what kind of relationship you have with uh, that entity, that person or that company, uh, and, and who they are and, and where they are and what their business is when you're taking JavaScript and uh, putting it on your website that's loading from their server. Because at any time, they can change that code and have it do something else. Uh, they can you know, immediately release uh, new code whenever they like. Um, and I'll open it up for a discussion just for the last couple minutes that we have. Yes, ma'am. That would also include any of the scripts you in, uh, install for the Facebook fixes, then, because they're all yeah, yeah. It's any JavaScript that you you put on your site. So you're saying we need to trust Facebook to not use. You do, and th there are. <laughs> yeah. Oops. Now th there are some uh, security mechanisms in place. You can do something that prevents the vendor from ever changing that script, but. A lot of these vendors, in fact, I think Google Analytics is one of these, they, they rely on the ability to release new code as they, as they do new releases on their site, uh, on their, uh, in, the, in their product. And so that kind of breaks Google Analytics and it breaks other uh, vendors' code when you do that. So there's been a debate in the community of how to, how to deal with this. And, and I think it's worth just creating a bit of awareness uh, on um, thinking about who, who these people are that you're allowing onto your site. Um, did you have a question? So um, I was, I'm just starting in WooCommerce, mm. and uh, very interesting, very, and a lot of work. But anyway, um, I had needed a plugin, so I got a plugin, the, and a couple of plugins. One guy had a secure way of interfacing. The other guy was like, you know, just send me an email. This is all good or whatever. And then, but the first guy said, well, I can't really help you with this, but I'm going to give you to another. So how do you, on WooCommerce, how do you know about, it's like with WordPress, how do you know about the plugins, whether they're good or not, and whether whether or not they're trustworthy? Or, is that uh, no, I actually question. had a whole section called supply chain attacks, and that's exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> Matt, you want to chat about that a little bit? Yeah, um, so, you know, one of the things that we do, and, and it, we're actually looking into better ways to do this is to kind of establish um, reputation within plugins. You know, there, there are indicators just within the directory already when it comes to reviews. Um, if if the the plugin actually has um, security vulnerabilities uh, disclosed in the past, it, some people may think that that actually is an indicator that the plugin is insecure. But if it's, if it's been fixed, it, it actually means that the plugin has been audited by someone, which is good. And, and there's a lot of plugins that haven't. Um, and, and you know, most users don't know about that, and it's. Uh, you know, is there a place you can go to see if it's been audited? Um, no. Wow, that's a great industry. Well, it's, we it's were a, doing quite a bit of thinking about that last night at the uh, at the bar, where a lot of thinking <laughs> happens. And uh, Sean, uh, you've done quite a bit of thinking about um, plugin <coughs> reputation, I think, and we were sharing some of your thoughts last night with uh, with uh, me and Aaron as we were chatting. Um, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I don't. I don't want to speak for uh, the word word. Uh, press team but I think that it's that's an issue that's definitely on their mind and and they're trying to improve 
Um, I know there's one project uh, out there right now called Tide, and um, WordPress is working along with Google uh, engineers to um, create a, a system and a process for auditing the code quality of plugins and uh, presenting that to, to users. Um, but we, we believe that a, a very important part of that is security also and um, monitoring uh, these plugins. Uh, we, there's a lot of uh, data points that you can use to um, basically calculate a risk score for each plugin or each update. And, and so that's something that we're actively, actively working on developing. But um, yeah, it's definitely a, 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 a hairy I mean, problem. The second plugin, I was like, oh, I just can't do it. So I went and got a developer and I said, that I know. Mm. And I said, I need to do X, Y, and Z because it was like, I'm not even going there with this guy. There's, there's other layers to that, too. I don't know if you've uh, read any of our research on, like, Mason Soiza or Stacey Wellington, too, where they, these um, bad actors are basically buying plugins and installing backdoors in them with the purpose of um, either Black Hat SEO or other things like that. And it's not exploiting a vulnerability or anything like that. It's, it's intentionally placed there by the developer who's a new... And you're paying for it. <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah, the users, yeah. The, the users suffer a lot as a result. Yeah. So, so, basic, so basically, if a plugin was safe at one point, it doesn't mean that it's always safe. Yeah. And so, it, if, especially if it changes hands or somebody else gets access to commit code to it, it could very easily be malicious the next day. Yeah. Is there a way to scan for our plugins periodically for that kind of thing? Yeah, you could, when you run a malware scan, uh, you'd be scanning those plugins. But really, the issue is uh, scanning those updates before they get installed on your site. Because if, you ins if there's a malicious update and you install it, you just compromised your, your right, own site. Right. So how do you do that? That's a good question. <laughs> Have a dummy site and install it there and scan it? Yes. But you call that out, right? Because that's what we were just talking about. You, you would call that out as a you, site might be compromised, but then it gets called out and you can fix it. Right. right. Yeah, so there's a big, um, there's a lot of energy put into research to identify uh, bad, uh, vulnerable code um, and, and bad actors and malicious behavior, that kind of thing. Um, there, there's kind of a security business model around it, I suppose. Um, some of the researchers are consultants, um, and so they'll uh, do some research, um, work confidentially with folks to kind of fix the underlying issue. And then uh, at an agreed time where, when it's safe and the problem's been solved, they'll disclose to um, the public. They'll tell the story, really. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that process has been evolving over time, but it's reached a pretty stable point um, where there's companies like um, HackerOne and BugCrowd that uh, provide a platform to, to do this. And um, the way the researchers benefit is... Um, they will drum up more consulting business or sell more product or whatever. Yeah. So there's quite a big ecosystem around the WordPress community that, that does this uh, kind of research. It keeps an eye on things and if there's something bad out there, you'll, especially if it affects a popular plugin or, or core, you'll definitely hear about it. Yeah. Well, you guys do a good job. With, you know, I get your emails all the time. Thank you. Today. Well, folks, I think we're running up on... Uh, we're, We've actually run over quite a bit. Um, no, no, you're fine. You have it until you actually have it until five dollars. Okay. Oh. Sorry, but well, alrighty then. <laughs> 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 Who wants to talk about crypto mining? <laughs> yeah, let's talk about Bitcoin. Uh, go ahead. Man. I don't know. I want to change my question. Uh, but no, um, GDPR. Red Dog comes in did recently. Mm -hmm. A lot of the WordPress. I don't even see anything here about it with this WordCamp. Yeah. Does anybody? Okay. Have, like, three weeks? I haven't seen anything, uh, and that's a, a really great question. Um, I'll tell you what we're doing about it. Um, uh, Kerry Boyd, who's my co-founder, and GDPR. And, he was asking about what, what, repeat the question. Oh, sorry. Um, so um, uh, there was a question about GDPR, which is a uh, European privacy regulation that's coming into force. Um, Aaron, do you know the date offhand? Is it? Is it okay? Uh, obviously, I'm not the one working on it internally, <laughs> but um, uh, and it's um, 
don't want to call it onerous, but it, it changes things quite radically and um, places uh, new obligations on um, vendors, uh, software vendors, service vendors, uh, websites, and so on. Uh, internally, what we've done is um, my co-founder, uh, uh, Kerry, uh, is working with our legal team at K&L Gates. Um, they've been working now for several months um, to get our house in order. Um, my understanding, I don't want to speak for Kerry, but uh, my understanding is that, um, and in my involvement, has been doing an audit on what data we have, what data we store, uh, where that data falls, in, in you know, which sort of category under GDPR that data falls, and um, what we need to do about that uh, in terms of um, uh, information to our, our users and our customers, uh, and what we need to do in terms of um, sites that use uh, WordFence, our product, um, to, pr to protect themselves. Um, that, as I mentioned, that project's been underway for uh, quite a long time um, uh, with us, and it's coming to a conclusion now. Um, we'll be done soon and before the deadline. Uh, I think what's important to, to sort of note is I, I can't advise you on GDPR. Right? It's not, not my sort of area of, of uh, expertise, um, and, and um, I don't think um, my colleagues, uh, would, I think my colleagues would say the same, but um, it, it's not a checkbox. It, it's a big change, uh, and if you um, think you might be affected by it, I would um, definitely start reading about it and seek legal counsel if necessary uh, and get your house in order. Um, that's kind of all I have to say about it. Go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, and, and regarding WordPress core and the project around it in itself, it's been an ongoing project for months and months as well for us to get our house in order as well to make sure that everything is compliant. You know, and a lot of it, because this is a uh, product that you can install and use on your own, uh, a lot of what GDPR requires still falls to you. Um, so Core itself is compliant at this point along with, um, as far as we can tell, all of our infrastructure now, although there's still um, an audit that's just wrapping up, hired out a, a third party audit to make sure that everything in WordPress double over again, the WordCamp sites and all those things which interact, that WordPress interacts with you know, through the, the events module and things like that, that they're all compliant as well. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a big deal. It's a it's a serious change. And if you interact with basically Europe in any way, it's a thing that um, you definitely need to research into or hire somebody to research into for you. And it, it comes into where do you store your data? in Europe, um, in the United States? Do you have European customers storing their data in the US? That kind of thing. So It's an interesting and fun problem. <laughs> um, so we'll touch on crypto mining for, for a few minutes. Um, uh, Bitcoin is something you've all heard of. And um, mining Bitcoin uh, requires um, powerful uh, GPU processors or custom-built um, uh, processors to kind of speed things up. Uh, you can't just do it on a regular CPU, but uh, there's a currency called uh, Monero that was invented a little bit after Bitcoin, and uh, you can mine uh, <coughs> Monero using uh, CPU resources, and you don't get any significant advantage from using a GPU. And so that is interesting to um, malicious folks because uh, all of a sudden using your um, uh, browser resources becomes attractive. And so we've seen a proliferation of um, um, Monero miners uh, using um, CoinHive, which provides kind of back end for, um, for Monero mining, uh, infect websites. Um, and the malicious code that they drop mines Monero in visitor browsers and sends the, the money to the attacker. And so this is just another example of a, a new uh, emerging business model that attackers are using. Um, you know, at our booth, uh, I get a question all the time, of why, why do they attack my website? And uh, there's a variety of reasons, but it's really mostly financial these days. It's about SEO spam. Uh, it's about uh, Monero mining, um, that kind of thing. And it, 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 uh, and ransomware as well, and, and all of these are, are sort of new business models that have emerged and, and kind of stabilized. And um, 
that's the main motivator these days. It's there's there's not not, a, not, a, not very much uh, graffiti going on because it's uh, more profitable to do those other things. Um, any any follow up comments there, guys? Thoughts on on that on crypto mining or anything like that? Uh, just just one. Uh, you, you've already mentioned browser based crypto mining, but it, we have seen a shift from. Um, server-side crypto mining where you would actually, uh, um, an attacker would compromise a site or sites and then utilize the server's resources to mine for cryptocurrency. And it's been a shift that's moved over to browser-based, which is quieter. Hosting providers don't know about it, whereas they would know um, if, you know, if a server is maxed out at CPU or GPUs. Um, so it's, it's a quieter attack, and we're seeing it um, a lot more often now. How does it present itself? I mean, is it? Yeah. It's a, a snippet of JavaScript, just like oh. we had. Yeah. 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 It's going to say the fan of your computer starts <laughs> yeah. making a whole lot of noise oh, yes. when you visit your own right website. Yeah. <laughs> so just from the standpoint of the code itself. Yep. Yeah, that's a good sign, though. The fan starts speeding up. You know, yeah. Your resources, your resources yeah. peak. Are there some browsers that are more at risk than others? Um, well, it's really a, a, a website problem. You know, the attacker targets the website itself and drops their code uh, into the website uh, as, as JavaScript that then loads into the browser. Uh, I, I think, don't quote me on this, but I think that code is compatible across browsers. Do you guys know? So, you know, you, it'll exploit you um, either way. Does that just work while they're on this side? Mm, yeah, that's right. The yeah, the code has to be has to be running. Um, go ahead. That was my question. Okay. Yeah. Could that spread to a PHP or a server side software that would actually start attacking server side resources? Yeah, I think as Matt was saying, um, we we started seeing that initially where server side resources would be used. But you know, why use um, one server when you can have a thousand servers, which is really what a thousand concurrent visitors on a single website are. They're providing a thousand workstations that whose resources can be used to uh, to mine uh, currency. So on a busy website, um, they can do a lot of work. And uh, so, like Silicon Valley with refrigerators. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> no. Silicon Valley. They use Wi-Fi pineapples at a, and, and, and they started basically harnessing. Uh, they need to get their software out, and they ended up. It's kind of complicated, but they ended up. Using IoT on 16,000 refrigerators. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? This is what I get for stopping, <laughs> stopping off the of season one. I get to catch up on my insights. They ran their software on, on, on people, so on such a small amount on, on IoTs, which were the, the smart refrigerators. Yeah. And, uh, they were able to accomplish their goal. I had out and it all accidentally nice. happened. It's, it's a good mm. show if you're a geek. I, I literally considered um, buying, uh, I think it was PlayStation 2s at the time because uh, Sony sells those that kind of break even because they really make the money off the games. So I was like, well, the cell processor is really powerful, and so maybe I can rack a whole bunch of PS2s and run, I think there's a, there's a Linux variant you could run on it, and there's maybe even MySQL and Apache, and I was like, what if we racked, you know, 20 PS2s, would it be cheaper than buying actual servers? So. Back in the days before <laughs> drones were sold in the stores, we used to use the uh, PS2, uh, because it's got the uh, accelerometer and the barometer and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. and all, all things that you need to fly a drone yeah. long before they were ever developed in stores. So, nice. you know, cool. totally just, and they were, caught, they were 11 bucks, as yeah. opposed to going out and buying an RC controller, which was 150 to 200 bucks. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so, I'm going to... Um, I just have one yeah, other quick... Go ahead. Have fun. Go ahead. But it's bringing politics into it. So oh boy, here we go. <laughs> You know whether or not we were hacked. Some of our um, voter machines were hacked, mm. and they were actually able to to change the vote. Mm. Well, I tell you what, I'm not going to address that directly, but we published some research that supported a particular narrative, and boy, um, Russia Today got on the phone quickly to me and suggested I do an interview with them, and, and stupidly I, I did. Um, just wanted to share data, you know, but quickly realizing that uh, I'm, I'm just supporting a narrative and it's not about the data. And we withdrew very rapidly, and we were almost harassed to um, do follow-up interviews, and we just said, you know what, we're not a political organization. We don't want to get wrapped up in the debate or the narrative. Um, we put the data on our blog, do with it as you will, and leave it at that. Um, Voting machines is definitely not an area of expertise for us, so I can't really comment on that at all. But is it possible, though, for 
something to, well, let me ask it this way. Hmm. Is it possible for code to get put on a system and reside there for three years and then um, be turned on for a specific period of time, turned off after a specific period of time, and then removed? Is that possible? Yeah, and yeah, um, you know what might be an, an interesting example of that, Matt, is um, the attack on the Natanz um, uh, uranium enrichment facility with uh, Stuxnet, where um, you had code that was kind of latent and uh, made its way into a refinement facility and it targeted uh, industrial control systems. And uh, it was probably deployed perhaps months, maybe even a year or two before it activated under certain conditions, recognizing a certain environment. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so, so that if, if, there's a lot being written about that. Um, there's some really fun um, books that are quite accessible where you can kind of read the history of that. But that, that's an example of, uh, and it's a, it's a sophisticated attack. And you know, you, you probably find a fairly sophisticated threat actor uh, engaging in those kinds of tactics um, and a very um, attractive target. So, um, just to kind of wrap things up, guys, sort of a shameless non-commercial plug. Um, we're running a capture the flag contest, and uh, it's um, our goal is really to get you to think like a like a hacker. Uh, and so, what a CTF is is um, uh, usually they have them at hacking conferences like DEF CON and Black Hat and so on. And um, they're a series of security challenges that you solve. And sometimes it's just solving a puzzle. Sometimes it's actually hacking into something. And um, what we've done is we've tailored that for WordPress. <laughs> and WordPress. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what? So so we've made us uh, very accessible, and um, it, whether you're if you're a beginner or intermediate, um, you know, uh, get going on it because uh, if you know how to view source in a browser, who knows how to do that? All right, so you're going to solve the first challenge, and when you do that, you get a coffee mug. But um, uh, it gets progressively more and more challenging, and we've got kind of prizes along the way. And uh, we're not, there's no you know, big commercial intent there. It's just uh, a way to shift your mindset and get you thinking like an adversary and, and to, to better help you protect your, your website from, from hackers. So um, it started earlier today. You've still got plenty of time. It's running until 2 p.m. tomorrow. So um, noon, noon tomorrow. Oh, uh, actually, we're, we're doing prizes. Oh, is it noon tomorrow? It's, yeah, okay. it, it okay. ends at noon, and then we're doing prizes at uh, at two. Okay, but you probably can't have oh, it. Uh, one minute. Worth that no. <laughs> <laughs> I purposely <laughs> didn't put one that on it. <laughs> if you do, let us know. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, so prizes are at one, and oh, okay. the, the contest finishes at twelve. Okay. okay. All right. Tell them um, about the lock picking. Oh, and if you want, to, thank you. And if you want to learn how to pick a lock, um, Sean and Matt are. Um, pretty darn good at doing that. They, they taught me to pick my first lock yesterday, and I can't tell you how satisfying it is. So, um, they brought some of their gear with them. It's over at our booth, uh, and they have a series of locks that start from really easy with just one tumbler to progressively more difficult. That's how they taught me last night, and we ended up having a lock picking party that went till 3.30 a.m. <laughs> so we're all like drinking a little bit of extra caffeine today. But um, you know, come visit us at the booth, and we'll, we'll show you how to, how to pick a lock. Um, I, I think that's about it, guys. Right? Thank you.